Well, it's been another successful day exploring the galaxy. Canoids, love what you're doing with propulsion. We gotta talk later, all right? Hey, rogue AI, you have so many ships now. It's amazing, congratulations, seriously, it's big for you. And Mantids, you, you keep on trucking. You know, you're all right. Okay, I'm gonna see you all tomorrow. Peace. <sighs> all right, let's get started. Um, quick question, what the hell happened to all of you? Did you turn evil? Come on, guys, you know if you're gonna turn evil, you gotta tell me. I feel left out. I thought we were on the same page here. Mantids, you can put that down. Okay, I don't need that kind of energy from you right now. Now, listen, I'm gonna go home, I'm gonna turn evil, then tomorrow we're all gonna be evil, it's gonna be great, you'll see. All right, guys, who's ready to break some rules? Come on, guys. We talked about this. Hey everybody, my name is Shay Parker and this is RTFM, the show where I teach you how to play a game. And today we're looking at Galactic Era, a space-based 4X game with a twist. You see, of the many factions you can play, each one will have a light and dark side. You'll be exploring the stars, learning new technologies, getting into fights and all that good stuff. But while writing your part in this galactic epic, you'll also be shifting between ideologies. This morality system has a profound effect on gameplay and I can't wait to tell you about it. So let's dive in. Alright, so before we get started, just a couple pieces of important info. First off, while I don't expect to get anything wrong, in case a mistake finds its way in, I'll be using the Klingon subtitles to correct them, so please turn those on or check the description box below. Second, this video is sponsored by the publishers, CJ Games, so a big thank you to them. And lastly, this video will teach the base game at 3-6 to six players. There's some differences in a solo or two-player game, which I'll be covering in a separate video. You'll still need to watch this one first if you don't know how to play the base game, but I'll post a link to the other video in the description. Okay, now that that's done, let's dive in. Galactic Era casts you as one of 17 different factions, all vying to be the best bird person, cat boy, or yeti in all of space. So first we gotta build that space. The set of instructions are pretty easy to follow, so I'm just gonna cover a few key concepts. The map is made up of these large tiles called sectors, which are placed randomly. There's always a center tile, and each player has a starting tile, so if you have fewer than six players, there will be some gaps. Place connecting wormhole tiles on the appropriate spaces, we'll talk more about them later, and place star and relic counters on the planets following the setup rules. Each player has a home system where they'll place their home star and three ships. Oh, and by the way, I'm using the upgraded ships pack with different models for each player color. In the base game, they'll all look like this. Now your home sector also gives you a little bonus, shown in the center space. The rulebook has an extensive glossary, but this one, for example, gives us a tech boost in robotics. Each player gets a technology board, and since we started with that robotics bonus, we bump up the track by one. You also get a population board filled with discs, and of course, a faction of your own. Some of these might have their own setup changes, so make sure to check for that, and if they give you a tech boost that you already got from the map, or if it conflicts with what the map gives you, the faction board takes priority. So just choose a different tech to increase for your map bonus. Factions can also start on their light side, which represents their ideology of service towards others, or STO, or their dark side, service towards self, or STS. The last thing you set up at the beginning is this round and point tracker. The goal of the game is to earn the most destiny points at the end of eight rounds, and as the round tracker moves forward, you'll go through different eras of light and darkness, which provide different ways of scoring points based on your galactic story. You'll also score points from dominance cards that are passed out at the start, and at the end game from your population and ship presence on the board. There might also be a galactic goal, but you don't have to play with this if it's your first game. And again, all of these icons are explained in the glossary, but I'll cover a few of them as we go. And with that, we're just about ready to start, so how about we do a quick overview of the gameplay before getting into the nitty gritty. As I mentioned, Galactic Era is played over eight rounds. During a round, you'll have four phases, move in combat, growth, trading, and scoring, with most of the gameplay happening during those first two. Move in combat is where you'll move your ships and get into combat. Shocker, I know. But you'll also be organizing your ships into fleets, whose numbers and abilities will be hidden from your opponents. Growth is where you'll spread out your population, build new ships, improve your technology, change the turn order, and perhaps most importantly, change your alignment. Which isn't just a cosmetic change, by the way. Some factions have different abilities between alignments, and all factions interact with the game and each other differently while on STS versus STO. 
Anyway, after growth, you have trading, where you can exchange tech with your neighbors so long as you aren't at war with them. And the scoring phase is when you score points and prep for the next round. So with all that in mind, let's start with phase one, move in combat. All right, so the basics of movement and combat are pretty straightforward, but there's also some minutia that we're gonna have to go through. This phase has three steps, which each player will take before passing to the next player in turn order. First, you can create and swap fleets, next you move, and lastly, you have combat. I'm gonna start with movement first, though. During this step, you can move all of your ships. The range of your ships is listed on the propulsion track of your tech board, which starts at three. Now you can fly through other player ships, but if you end up on the same space and you're at war, combat will happen. But before we get into all that, we gotta cover some of that minutia I mentioned. First, let's talk about the different spaces on the map. These clouds on the board are nebula spaces, and moving into a nebula space costs two point of movement instead of one. However, if a ship starts its movement on a nebula, it gains plus two to its speed for that turn. Next up are those wormholes we placed between sector tiles. These spaces with matching wormholes are considered adjacent, so you can usually go right through them. There are also neutron stars, which are usually impassable, and asteroids, which help with ship production, but I'll talk more about both of those later. And lastly, each sector has seven or eight stars. Yes, I know they look like planets, that's just showing you the sexiest planet in the star system. Anyway, at the beginning of the game, you set out a bunch of these star tokens on each world, as well as ancient relics on the inner sector. The normal star tokens tell you whether or not these systems are inhabited, and if so, by primitive or advanced cultures. The relics will have unique boons that I'll talk more about later. You'll reveal them if you try to colonize, but also at any time except in the middle of ship's movement, you can scout a tile if you have a ship in its space, secretly looking at it before putting it back. Just remember that if you move and then scout a tile, that ship can't move any more this round. You can scout the ancient relics too, and if you've developed your spirituality, each turn you can do remote viewing a number of times as shown in the tech. Each use of remote viewing allows you to scout any token on the board, or the top card of the domination deck, or another player's entire fleet, provided their spirituality is lower than yours. And don't worry, I'll be giving context for those last two in a bit. Going back to propulsion, if you advance it enough, you gain access to stargates, which connect stars as if they were wormholes. Stargate level one requires that you own both the entrance and exit stars, and have at least three population on them. And by the way, your home star is considered to have six population minimum. If you have Stargate 2, that connects any star on the map, provided you're not at war with its owner. This means you can use unclaimed stars and even those neutron stars that, without this tech, were completely impassable. Now this can be blocked by other players, so in order to talk about that, we need to cover War and Peace. Everyone starts out at peace with everyone else, meaning you all exchange these peace tokens during setup. While peaceful, you can end your movement on each other's spaces, and you won't have to worry about fighting. You'll even be able to trade later on, but if you're at war, a few things are different. We'll get to combat in a second, but when you want to move through a wormhole or stargate, things get a little tricky. To move through a stargate, you can't have enemy ships on either the entrance or exit. Wormholes you can go through, but if there's an enemy on the exit side, you'll have to stop there and you'll fight about it when combat comes up. And the last little hiccup is that you can declare war during another player's turn while they're in the middle of moving. At least, you can do this if your faction is STS. Dark side factions can declare war during another player's turn if it blocks them from doing something. So you could be peaceful up until the moment a player wants to go through a wormhole and then show up and be like, nope, sorry, also I hate you. Now for Stargates, block movement is technically canceled, so the moving player can choose somewhere else to go with their blocked ships, but for wormholes, if you block the exit while your enemy's moving, they're stuck in that fight. Speaking of, let's talk about combat. After a player has finished all their movement, if they have any ships in the same hex as an enemy, i.e. a player they're at war with, that'll trigger a battle. And if there's more than one, the active player chooses the order in which they resolve. Let's do a very basic battle first, and then we'll see how it works when we start complicating things. Here, we're at war with Orange. We have four ships, and they have three. There's a step before combat where a player might retreat, but let's skip it for now. Combat doesn't have any luck involved. You just compare the combat strength of each side, and whoever has the most is the winner. The way you calculate this is by multiplying the number of ships you have by your combat value, which is shown on your military tech track. This starts at one, so if neither of us has researched how guns work, we're still at four to three, and so we win. Go us. The winning player decides how many opposing ships to destroy, so you can kill anywhere from all to none of them. 
The main reason you might want to exercise restraint here is that unless you defeated them with overwhelming force, which means your total strength was at least three times as much as theirs, you're going to suffer losses as well. And the amount of ships you lose in retaliation is equal to half of the ships that they lose, rounded up. So if we destroyed all three of their ships, we would lose two. Of course, if we did have overwhelming force, either from having a ton of ships or a very advanced military, we wouldn't lose anything. Now, if the winner doesn't destroy all of the loser's ships, the loser will have to retreat, meaning they move to an adjacent hex that has no enemy ships in it. Retreat can't be prevented, so if all adjacent spaces are filled with enemies, just go out another space. Oh, and you can't retreat through a wormhole. Okay, so that was a simple combat. Let's mix it up a bit, starting with an early retreat. If a defending player has a higher spirituality or propulsion tech level than the attacker, they can leave the space before combat even happens, following normal rules for retreat. Next, if more than one enemy has ships in the combat zone when the fighting starts, you only have one fight and they'll combine their strength against you. If they lose, they'll retreat in turn order. If they win, the player with the most ships, or earlier in turn order if tied, chooses which ships are destroyed, both on the attacker side and the defenders. So here, if the defenders force three hits on green, blue can choose for yellow to take both of the retaliation hits, like a jerk. And lastly, if the attacker and defender's total strength is tied, first tiebreaker is higher military tech level, and then if that's tied, the defender wins. And while that's probably a lot to remember, there's a handy reference guide to remind you of all this. Okay, so the last thing to talk about here is fleets, and it's going to shake up both combat and movement. Fleets are represented by stacks of these black poker chips, and they're a way to both condense your units so they're easier to move around, and to hide your strength, both in numbers and in special abilities. See, before movement happens, you can form and swap fleets. This can only happen at stars you control, meaning you have population there, and you can have up to five fleets on the board. First, take chips with a value equal to the number of ships you're putting into the fleet and replace them on the board face down. You also have these dummy chips, and you should probably throw one of these in as well. I'll explain why in a second. Each fleet has a special ability, so choose one of the five fleet tactics and place it on top of the stack, also face down. But you don't have to reveal this when you choose it. The exception is fleet D, because this affects movement, so it's always visible. And if these stacks get high enough that they might topple over, you can grab one of these pizza box ottomans to help keep them together. Now, if you're swapping fleets, that means you're moving fleet tokens between fleets or changing them out with new ones from your supply. You can also bluff here by taking the tokens off and then placing them back without changing them. So you have to reveal the chips you add, but once that's done, at any time during your turn before combat starts, you can swap chips between fleets that are on the same space, add or remove ships from a fleet, or dissolve it entirely. If you add or remove anything, you have to show those chips, but if you're swapping chips between fleets, you don't have to show which ones, which is why having those zeros in there will help you keep your true strength concealed. However, you can never have a fleet with zero ships in it, so you'll just have to be honest about that. Also, you always need to keep in mind a ship's maximum range. If you move a ship into a space and then merge it into a fleet, that fleet won't be able to move any farther than that first ship would have been able to go. When you get into combat, once the fighting starts, both players need to reveal their fleets and all of the chips within them, adding up combat strength as normal, but taking the fleet abilities into account. The assault fleet adds one combat value per ship, the counter assault adds two CV per ship if the opponent has an assault fleet in the fight, and the evade lets you retreat before combat regardless of technology levels, but only as the defender. And with evade, you'd only need to reveal the fleet token, not the chips. If you have multiple fleets in a battle, their effects only apply to the ships within their stack. Now the dart fleet provides a plus one movement bonus to its ships, but has no effect in combat, and I'll talk about the bomb fleet in the next part of the video, which we're almost ready to get to. Just, just one more thing about fleets. When you advance military to levels two, four, and six, you get these advanced fleet tactics, which will place on one of the fleet types. These have two sides, and after being placed, can't be changed. If you place it on the point side, Anytime this fleet wins a battle, you'll gain three points. However, you can only gain it once per battle, even if you have multiple fleets with this upgrade participating in the fight. The other side doubles the effect of the fleet. So Assault now provides a plus two bonus per ship, Counter Assault is plus four, Dart adds two to your range, and the Evade fleet allows you to wait until the attacking player reveals their fleet before choosing whether or not to retreat. Okay, that's all for move and combat. I know it was a lot, but that's a pretty good chunk of the game. The other big part is growth, so let's do that next. 
So if moving combat is all about positioning and conflict, the growth phase represents the industry of your civilizations. In this phase, you'll settle on planets, build ships, improve your technology, and occasionally change your whole worldview. Every player has a set of oval and square tiles, and at the beginning of this phase, you'll all secretly choose two ovals and one square. The ovals are growth actions, and the squares are either a specific technology or a choice to raise or lower your turn order. You can also play one additional growth token for each non-home world you control with a population of five or more. Just add the extra ovals to your stack before revealing. However, for each additional action you take, you also lose three points, and you can go into the negatives. Also, this can be blocked by enemy ships in those systems, but if you want to declare war in order to block an additional action, you have to do so before the tiles are revealed. Anyway, let's talk about how these actions work, starting with changing alignment. This will happen before any other growth actions, so after you all reveal, anyone who played this token will flip their player board to its opposite side. This might change your abilities based on your faction, but one effect it has for everyone is that after you switch alignments, you must make peace with everyone you were previously at war with. Depending on your circumstances, you might be able to declare war again real soon, but for now, you have a ceasefire. After switching alignment, if anyone chose to change their turn order, then that happens next. Starting at the top and going down, everyone who chose to go up in turn order trades their chip in with whoever was one step higher than them. Then, in reverse turn order, everyone who wanted to go down swaps chips with whoever was beneath them. If you are already in first or last position, choosing the higher or lower tokens respectively doesn't have any effect. Once that's done, each player in turn order will do all of their remaining growth actions in the order of their choice. These actions are gaining stars, growing population, building ships, and researching technology. But before we go any further, I want to fully describe some things that I've mentioned a few times, war and blocking. Going to war when your STS is pretty easy. You can declare war on anyone during your movement, and you can declare war on anyone during growth if it blocks their action or allows you to take their star. No growth action can take place in or make use of a star with hostile ships in it, aka a blocked star, so declaring war at just the right moment can be pretty mean but also pretty useful. As an STO faction, however, your declaration options are severely limited. You can't ever declare war on another STO faction, and you can only declare war on an SDS faction if doing so would block them from taking over an innocent planet. In this case, innocent means either a neutral, primitive, or advanced planet, or one owned by another STO faction, and we'll see how that works in just a moment. The big caveat to all this blocking, however, is that if a faction has reached spirituality 5 or higher, their actions can no longer be blocked. Also, at any point, if both warring parties agree, they can choose to declare peace. Or, like we've seen, peace will be enforced when one side switches alignment. So, with all that in mind, let's look at gaining stars, because this works differently whether you're STO or STS, and it also depends on the star you're trying to gain. This will always require at least one ship on a star's location. If the star is neutral, first reveal the token. Neutral stars are always either uninhabited, have a primitive population, or an advanced population. If it's uninhabited, both STO and STS players can simply claim the star, taking one population disk from the lowest and rightmost space on your track and placing it on the planet. If the star is primitive, STO players cannot take the star, period. You're just too dang nice. STS players have no such qualms though and can subjugate it, needing only one ship to do so. You then place two population on the planet, as shown by the two disks on the token. If the star is advanced, STO players can ally with it, gaining three population, but STS players have to conquer it. In order to conquer a planet, you need more ships than the population present, which is considered to be three for an advanced world. And after conquering, place just one population. Oh, and by the way, whenever taking any kind of planet, if the ships are in fleets, you only need to reveal enough ships to prove you have what you need. Speaking of fleets, that bomb fleet that we skipped over earlier is important here. A bomb fleet effectively gives you an extra ship for every two ships you have. So two ships would count as three, four would count as six, etc. But this only comes into effect when conquering a planet. Or if the fleet is upgraded, ships count as double. So here your two ships would count as four, and that's enough to conquer the star. Now STS players can also conquer stars owned by other players, and it follows the same rules, with the caveat that you need to be at war, but again, you can declare war just before taking this action. And there are two additional effects. 
First, the original population is returned to its owner, and second is that when you take a star from another player, you also get to copy some of their technology. If they're a higher level than you in any techs, choose one of those to gain a level in on your own tech board. And if the planet had six or more population, you get to do this twice. Now, STO players can't conquer a planet owned by another player, but they can liberate it. If they're at war with an STS player, they can liberate their planet, again needing more ships than the population. But then instead of replacing with just one population, you match the original population with your own. You can also learn tech from your opponent, just like conquering. And by the way, everything we've just talked about has a reminder on your faction board, plus any important details that might be unique to you. Now, home stars can also be conquered or liberated, and are considered to have a population of six. The same rules apply, but the original owner will need to evacuate and place their home star somewhere else. This must be the star that they own with the most population and no hostile ships in its space. If two options are tied, you can choose, but if no options exist, just pick a hex of normal space in your home sector with no hostile ships and place your home star there. This is considered to be a star for the rest of the game. That's unlikely though, so assuming you evacuated to a regular star, you'll return all discs from there and your original home star space to your population track. Now, you can also voluntarily evacuate. If you're going before another player and you can see that they're about to take your home star, or if they have any number of ships there and you're just feeling skittish, you can choose to evacuate during your growth turn, following all the same rules as before, except you also place one population on the original star. This stops them from getting two techs off of you, and if they were going to liberate, one population is a lot less than the six they'd otherwise get to place. Just a few more things about gaining stars. You only get one star per gain star action, but you have two of these tokens, so you can get two stars in a round if you double up. Next, if you run out of population discs, you can either take from other stars to fill your needs, or just do a partial action and place fewer than you otherwise would. Now, if someone takes your home star, or any of your stars, leaving you with at least two fewer stars than anyone else, you can activate your emergency reserve. Everyone has this, and it's a one-time use ability, which gets you six free ships in your possibly new home star location. And lastly, these planets in the inner sector have ancient relics. You take control just like regular planets, but then you gain the benefit of their relic token. Most of these trigger immediately, granting boons like a free tech level or some ships, and then will disappear. Some of them are ongoing effects though, like this one that requires potential conquerors and liberators to have eight more ships than they otherwise would to take it from you. Leave these tokens on the board as a reminder of their powers. Okay, that's all for getting stars, and yeah, that was a lot. Let's do an easier one next. This tile lets you grow the population of those stars you've settled. You might first get some free growth, and then you can place bonus population based on your level in genetics. Let's look at free growth first. Each star, including your home star, has a free growth limit, which is determined by how far away it is from the nearest star with any player's population. The farther away, the higher the limit, because they're able to use all of the resources in their immediate vicinity, and thus have an easier time than the more urbanized galactic neighborhoods. Anyway, count the current population. If that's lower than the distance in hexes between it and the nearest populated star, it will gain one free population disk. Do this for each planet you control, and then you can add bonus population. Check your genetics level and add the matching number of bonus population disks. The growth limit doesn't apply here, so you can add to any star you own regardless of its population, but you can only add one bonus disk per star. And as a reminder, you can't do growth actions in blocked stars, so if enemies are blockading your planets, you can't add any population here. Oh, and this isn't technically part of the grow population action, but during your growth turn, if your propulsion tech is at level 5 or 6, you can teleport 1 or 3 population disks between stars, which might be useful to do before you get your free growth. And that's all for growing population. Another easy action is building ships, which is triggered by this token. First, look at your population track. The number below your current population is how many ships you start with. Then you add the number on your current robotics level. And finally, for each asteroid system where you have at least one ship, you'll add one more. From this pile of plastic, you can distribute them however you see fit among your stars with at least four population. And this prerequisite lowers as your robotics improves. While doing this action, you can place ships directly into existing fleets at those locations, or create new fleets but whenever placing new chips on the board, you need to first show them to prove they are what they should be. Though after you show these chips and prove your honesty, you can be secretive about which chips are actually going in which systems. 
Also, this action can be blocked in three ways. You can't place ships into stars with hostile ships, that's normal. But also, if you share an asteroid with a hostile ship, it won't count. And the population from blockaded stars won't be counted when determining how many ships you produce. Use this plastic chip to show your effective population when blocked like this, but you'll always be able to build at least two ships, provided you have a place to put them. And lastly, we have research, which requires both the growth action and for you to play a square token with one of the five technologies instead of a changed turn order token. You'll move up one level in that technology and that's it. This one's super easy. However, we should probably recap these techs and cover the ones we've missed, so let's go through them all. Military improves the combat value of each ship and gets you advanced fleet tactics. Spirituality lets you remote view. It eventually lets you trade without contact, more on that shortly. It stops you from being blocked by hostile ships. And at the end, it makes it so that whenever you lose population, instead of the disc going back to your track, it ascends, meaning you put it to the side, which will help you score points in the end game. Propulsion improves your ship's range, gives you the Stargate ability, lets you teleport population, and at the end, gains you infinite range meaning that when your ships move, you can just place them anywhere. Robotics gets you more ships every time you build, lowers the population necessary to place ships at your stars, and starting at fifth level, lets you choose two square counters per turn. This can be two techs to research, or one tech and a changed turn order. At level five, this costs two points to use, but at level six, it's free. And lastly, genetics improves your population growth and eventually reduces the cost to play additional growth actions. But there's one more thing. Each of these tracks will also give a bonus effect if you're at the end of them and research further. The military bonus is that you can block the growth action of a player you're at war with, provided they haven't taken their turn yet. Spirituality gets you a free growth action chosen from the oval tokens you haven't used this round, and it lets you exchange a domination card. Again, I'll talk about that shortly. Propulsion's bonus is two free gain star actions. Robotics gives you an additional level in the other tech token you picked, but has no effect on turn order tokens, and using this bonus costs you two points. And Genetics gets you a free grow population action with two extra bonus population, so eight instead of six. Technology is a very big deal in this game, and with only eight rounds, there's not a lot of opportunities to get it. But fortunately, after the growth phase, you get the chance to trade technology. So let's talk about that next, as well as how to score points and ultimately win the game. Alright, after growth we have the trading phase, but the only thing you can trade in this game is technology. If you're at peace with another player and you have contact with them, which means one of your ships or stars is sharing a space with one of their ships or stars, then you can trade tech. This must be a one for one trade, so you find one tech that they're better than you at and one where you're better than them. If both players agree to the trade, you each go up one level on the respective techs and you call it a day. You can only trade once per round, even if you have contact with multiple players, so choose wisely. The only exception is if you have spirituality at level 4 or higher. As we mentioned earlier, this lets you trade with any player without contact, but you can still only trade once. And since that's all for the trade phase, let's talk about scoring. There are several ways to score destiny points in this game. Some of them happen immediately when you achieve something, some happen at the end of each round during the scoring phase, and some are strictly endgame points. So let's look at all of them, starting with the Galactic Story. This is chosen during setup and runs along your round tracker. The game will be split into three eras, the first era of light, an era of darkness, and the second era of light. Each era will have different scoring triggers for which you'll find a detailed explanation in the rulebook, but let's take a look at this story, Rivalry, as an example. In the first era, every player will score a point during the scoring phase if they're an STO faction, and they'll also score a point for each gained star action they take. During the Dark Era, they'll gain a point each round for being STS, as well as if they're at war with any other players. In addition, each star they're blocking during the scoring phase will earn them a point. But each time a player retreats before combat, they'll lose two points immediately. And then in the Third Era, they'll get a point for being good guys again, and get three points per tech per round if they have the highest level in that field. So that's rivalry, but there are three other stories you might play with instead, so just make sure everyone knows what's important when you start playing. And one last thing, while all stories reward you for matching the alignment of the current era, that's not a prerequisite for scoring any of the other bonuses. Next up, we've got domination cards. You'll start with one of these cards, and by the end of the game, you'll score exactly two of them. Each card has an A section and a B section. The A section is something you can score if you meet its requirements. 
If that's the case, at any time you can play the card to the left of your tech board on the top side. You'll earn the points listed in the corner as well as the immediate effect. You don't have to play this card right away though, so you can hold on to it if that effect will better serve you later. You can also play a card for its B section. These give you a range of points based on various factors, all of which are detailed in the glossary. Now, after you play your first domination card, whether for its A or B effect, you get to draw a new one. Also, at the end of the first era, each player can choose to place their card on the bottom of the deck and draw a different one, and at the end of the second era, you can do this again. Or, if you haven't played a card by that point, you instead draw a second card and just keep both. When the game ends, any unplayed cards will then be played. If you qualify for the A sections, one of your cards can score that way and the other for its B, or both can score the B effect. Your choice. So, once you finish the 8th round, the game will end and you'll score those domination cards as well as three other endgame factors. First off, each player scores their current population, and keep in mind that the later spaces start going up by 2 or even 3 points per disc. Next there are galactic goals, which you don't have to play with if this is your first game, but if you do, this will provide a means for all players to score in some way. So this one, for example, gives players 10 points per star they control with an ongoing relic. And lastly, for each sector, the player who has the most ships there gains another 4 points. Count all this up, and whoever has the most points is the winner. Or if it's tied, first tiebreaker is the player who controls the most stars, and second tiebreaker is whoever's earlier in turn order. And that's all you need to know to play Galactic Era. But the designers did want me to mention that there is an errata post on BGG with a few minor corrections. This is mostly for individual factions, and I've included a link to it in the description box below. And as a reminder, there's another video that teaches the solo and two-player variant rules, so make sure to check that out. Anyway, thank you all so much for watching, and I'll see you next time. Bye!